web seminar no, no Pasaran, Antifascism in Europe Today. This seminar uh, takes place in the framework of the summer seminars organized by the party of the European left and Transform Europe. They are a small substitute for our annual summer <laughs> university that we organize normally uh, together that cannot take place due to the pandemic um, circumstances for the second year. Um, my name is Barbara Steiner. I'm the director of Transform Europe and I'm happy to moderate uh, today's web seminar uh, on anti-fascism uh, in Europe. Uh, there is interpretation available to English, French and Spanish, but for those who watch on Facebook, you have to register via our website and enter our Zoom room to be able to uh, hear the interpretation. You can hear the interpretation if you click on the globe symbol at the bottom of your controls. I'm very uh, happy to welcome um, our four speakers. Um, uh, I'm very happy to introduce them when they will take the floor. Gala Kabash, uh, Kate Hudson, Esther Bartas, and uh, Walter Bayer. We will speak today about what means anti-fascism in Europe today. Um, there is the big question, there will be next year's French presidential elections. Is there a possibility Marine Le Pen uh, could win these elections, uh, that Rassemblement National uh, vict victory, uh, it would uh, have an impact on the whole future of the EU. But there are already also um, uh, extreme right or uh, far right parties in governments in Europe and the um, support for uh, far right uh, parties is growing in Europe. So we will have a look on the Cordon Sanitaire uh, concept and whether it is about to break and um, in what countries there is also the question on who votes for the far right. We will have a look at the far right electorate. We will um, see um, how political, other political forces, conservatives are connected and um, co coming uh, closer to the far right and um, cooperate. And also the question of historical revisionism and uh, the rise of far right uh, will be tackled. And last but not least, what the role of profit interests behind the rise of the far right is and what we can learn from historical fascism theories. Um, I will, without further ado, give now the floor to Gala Kabash. I'm very happy to have her opening our um, seminar. Gala is uh, a researcher at Espace Marx, the French member of Transform Europe. Um, and she's the facilitator of the working group on strategies against the far right in uh, Transform <coughs> Europe. Gala, the floor is yours. Hello everyone. Thank you, Barbara, for this introduction. Um, I would like to thank the EL and Transform staff for uh, organizing this great event. Um, I'm very happy to be there with you today. Um, just like in other countries, uh, the situation in France uh, regarding the, the rise of the far right is quite alarming. Uh, many events could and should call for our attention as they attest uh, the situation uh, from the recent assault of young people watching the football game uh, by the radical far-right activist in the street of Lyon to uh, recurring police brutality and racism to uh, draft le legislation uh, that pretend to act against terrorism but actually target and stigmatize uh, Muslim people. But some people would argue that uh, these are all unrelated events uh, and that the Republican spirit uh, will stop again uh, the French nation to be uh, ruled uh, by a far-right president. <clears throat> well, um, a recent poll 
uh, published in March uh, 2021 uh, in the French newspaper, uh, Le Journal du Dimanche, indicates uh, a possibility of Marine Le Pen uh, winning the next presidential election. Um, if the poll uh, points to a victory of Emmanuel Macron or Xavier Bertrand, uh, a conservative uh, right candidate, it also indicates a victory of Marine Le Pen against Anne Hidalgo, the socialist candidate, uh, Yannick Jadot, the green candidate, or uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the radical left candidate. So what does this poll tell us? It shows that the cordon sanitaire or the glass ceiling that has maintained uh, Marine Le Pen in second or third place in elections until now um, might, might not uh, last indefinitely. Uh, indeed, the poll um, clearly indicates that the cordon sanitaire, uh, the so-called Republic Republican Front, uh, would actually actually break uh, in case a left candidate takes the lead in the second round of the presidential election. The left voters keep resisting uh, and cast their ballots in favor of a right or a centrist candidate when it is to oppose the Rassemblement National because they are fueled by uh, a strong anti-racist uh, culture. Uh, but the right and centrist electorate uh, won't mobilize equally uh, to vote for a left or a radical left or a green candidature uh, against a far right opponent and will uh, rather massively choose to abstain from voting. This uh, opinion poll is of course not to be taken as a prophecy. Uh, it was conducted uh, more than a year ago be before the election um, and it prompts strong reservation, yet it needs to be taken seriously. Um, for this reason, I will try to answer um, these questions. Who are the, the far-right voters? And is the far-right electorate a coherent ideological group? I think that this question matters. The, the Rassemblement National had positioned itself for years as a vote of anger, as the major opposition party, and also as a niche party specialized in one unique issue. But now uh, their ambition has changed and they want to appear as a presidential party or a majority party. Um, we know that the far right voters, uh, we know them to be united on the topics of nationalism, uh, xenophobia, but do they agree on further issues? Um, with the support of Transform, uh, we conducted a survey to understand electoral choices uh, following the last European elections. Uh, this database provided us with a sample of far-right voters and their ideological and social characteristics. So historically, uh, the Front National uh, rhetoric was built on the stigmatization of immigrants. So it's not a surprise uh, to see in this survey a strong hegemony on the questions of immigration and xenophobia. Uh, we noticed that 78% of the far-right voters consider that immigrants uh, come to France to benefit uh, of the public health system, and 67% uh, of them consider that strangers or foreigners are a threat for uh, their culture. But beside this issue of immigration, uh, is the Rassemblement National electorate an homogeneous group? Uh, can they federate around uh, a more complete project of society? Uh, well, our results show um, strong uh, break lines in this group on various topics. First, on the economic question. Uh, we know that the far right voters, we know them to be divided uh, between a liberal group uh, inherited from the anti-communist ideology of Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, with a program claiming for more privatization and repro reproaching the state to be too uh, wasteful. And another group um, that would accord to the Marine Le Pen uh, 2012 twist on economic propositions. Uh, she developed a rhetoric based on uh, a subversion of the class struggle, shifting from the conflict uh, between capital and labor uh, to a conflict between the smalls and the bigs. Uh, these populist uh, propositions were to be found also in the 2017 uh, program, 
with proposition uh, of exiting uh, the euro. <clears throat> so we are seeing in the survey signs of these oppositions. For example, uh, the far right voters are split on the question of the state intervention with a part of them very in favor and another part strongly opposed. Um, but what also struck us is that the far right voters is the electoral group who has the highest rate of indifference regarding this topic, uh, these topics in spite of their centrality in the elaboration of a project of society. Um, these divisions are not only on the economic uh, issue. They are also to be seen in the cultural matters. Uh, their positions on, for example, same-sex same marriage are also very contradictory. Um, the way the Rassemblement National addresses the LGBTQ plus uh, community so shows a clear attempt to reach some uh, fragile balance that yet proved successful. Uh, although the party has, uh, was known to be homophobic in the past, it now displays a greater degree of tolerance towards sexual uh, minorities. And that's also the reason why uh, Marine Le Pen didn't take part in the huge demonstrations uh, against same-sex marriage where all the right uh, was present. Um, but we have the, the intuition that uh, her electorate remains undivided precisely because of the lack of position on this issue uh, within the party, um, since we see in our result uh, a clear disagreement on this topic in the same way uh, for the economic questions. So the hegemonity of the far right uh, on the issue of security, immigration, gives the Rassemblement National strong electoral opportunities especially since uh, these topics are at the heart of the general debate. Um, but if the Rassemblement National wants to be more than an opposition party, and they want to be more than this, uh, they will have to take position on other issues. Uh, and there, these divisions are to be seen by the left as strategic opportunities uh, to show, to take advantage of these uh, ideological uh, divisions of the far right voters. Um, this can be done by addressing uh, these issues uh, in the media, uh, in the political debates. Also, um, I think that these results show uh, the absolute necessity uh, for the left to develop uh, for the, the presidential election uh, a straightforward, straightforward anti-racist uh, stance in the public debate uh, in their program. Um, in the public debate because uh, we see a vast rhetoric uh, promoting a so-called cultural decline uh, and it has become dominant. And I think the, the, the DNA of the left uh, sets within this anti-fascist, anti-racist uh, ethos. And the next presidential election is an opportunity to affirm uh, again this, uh, this DNA. So this could be some strategical opportunities uh, that could be uh, approached. Um, and I will give the floor to the other because I think I, I have been a, a little bit too long already. Thank you very much, uh, Gala. Um, a very interesting uh, input and uh, thank you also for the um, strengthening your and your um, strategic proposals. Uh, I give the floor now to Kate Hudson. Kate Hudson is um, um, National uh, Officer of Left Unity Party in UK and board member of Transform UK, the British member organization of Transform Europe. Um, Kate organized also and co-organized also um, the No Passaran conference in London uh, 2019 and uh, uh, this year in, um, in uh, uh, online format. And uh, Kate uh, will tell us uh, about uh, the findings of the conference and we'll also have a look uh, to the uh, US and the global um, developments uh, of the far right. Kate, the floor is yours, please. 
Um, thanks very much, Barbara, and thanks for inviting me to what's a very important discussion. Um, I was going to come on to talking about the outcomes of the conference later on in the discussion, but to start off by talking a, a bit about um, the situation in Britain. Um, I'm sure that everyone here understands the real human consequences of far-right politics and is agreed on the need to defeat the far-right and to break its false narrative and its destructive power. But there's also a developing trend in the centre ground of politics towards accepting the far-right as part of the political landscape. And last week in the Financial Times, which is one of Britain's most serious mainstream papers, a columnist asserted that the rise of the far right hasn't threatened democracy in the way we feared 20 years ago when Jean-Marie Le Pen was standing for the French presidency. Uh, he said that far right parties have participated in governments and departed from governments without democracy ending. So the idea here is that the far right can be accommodated and that democracy safely adapts around it. Um, this approach, of course, is absolutely wrong, not least because the presence of far-right forces in the political arena has meant that their ideas have permeated the mainstream and are being taken up by supposedly centrist parties. Indeed, the political centre of gravity overall has moved to the right, shaped by the agenda of the far right. So I'd like to just look quickly at Britain as an example of this. Until very recently, Britain had not had a far right party with any significant support. The Brexit referendum enabled a huge upsurge in extreme nationalism, xenophobia and reactionary views. Immigrants were blamed for all the ills faced by ordinary people rather than the neoliberal economic policies that were actually to blame. So the Brexit party emerged as a vehicle for the expression of what was essentially hate politics. But it never made any headway in electoral terms, partly because of Britain's first past the post electoral system, but also because the anti-immigrant nationalist agenda was adopted by the Conservative Party under a new right wing leader, Boris Johnson. The situation was also interesting in Britain at that time because a left alternative was receiving significant support in the form of Jeremy Corbyn. The wave of support for radical left parties in Europe at that time found its outlet in Britain through the Labour Party. The Corbyn-led Labour Party attempted to break from the neoliberalism that so many social democratic parties had adopted, which had helped create the conditions for the surge in support of the far right, and which was largely responsible for their failure to present a political alternative to the far right. Now, as we know, mm -hmm. he was defeated by a combination of hostility from the right wing of his own party, lies and media and establishment sabotage, including false allegations of anti-Semitism. But the result is that the Labour Party under its new leadership now also makes concessions to the far-right agenda, including anti-immigrant policies, and it fails to stand up to the government's attacks on democratic rights. And it's now a regular feature to see the Labour leader backed by the British flag playing on the nationalist surge whipped up by Brexit. And in areas where Labour has lost working-class votes to the Conservatives, on nationalist or anti-immigrant grounds, it makes no attempt to present an alternative vision of what a more just and equal society could be like. Instead, it makes concessions to the far-right narrative. So this is not an acceptable absorption of far-right ideas within a flexible democratic system where democracy maintains the upper hand. It's this far-right politics getting the upper hand through the back door, and it has to be defeated, whatever it is called and wherever it is found. In rejecting the idea that the far-right can be made acceptable when it's part of a democratic landscape, it's also important to note that when far-right parties rule alone, rather than in coalition, their record is deeply shocking and unacceptable. 
A look at both Hungary and Poland make that very clear. And it's surprising that these have not met with more opposition internationally. Last week's French regional elections showed some interesting patterns. The Rassemblement National failed to win any regions and Macron's En Marche did badly. The mainstream Republican right and the left coalitions, including the Socialist Party, did well. Le Pen's party stood a chance in the French Southeast region, but she was defeated by an alliance of rival parties that formed a Republican front against the RN. This included the withdrawal of the Socialist Party and left-wing alliance candidate, which prevented the far right taking the region. And of course, what Gala has just been outlining is really important in this regard. There has been some discussion recently about the future of the cordon sanitaire against the far right, which appears to have been successful in southeastern France. But it seems to hold in some areas, some parts of Europe, but not others. And there are currently indications in both directions more widely in Europe. So, for example, in March of this year, the majority of parties in the Catalan parliament signed a cordon sanitaire against Vox, an agreement to, ref to refuse to work or cooperate with the far-right party. However, in a recent article in the Transform UK journal, Fabian Figueiredo has explained how the cordon sanitaire has fallen in Portugal, with parties of the Portuguese right making a national agreement with the new far-right Chega party to secure future government majorities. While electoral arrangements can be useful to prevent far-right victories, the extent of the problem, the political problem, requires political solutions. We're facing a political force that has many different manifestations and expressions, and the left needs to make its anti-fascist work a top priority. And Barbara, I'll conclude there, but hope to be able to add more in, in the next round about what uh, No Passaran uh, conference will be doing and other suggestions and feedback that came out of the previous conferences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate, uh, for these interesting insights and overview. And yes, we will have a second round uh, where we will talk about uh, also concrete uh, proposals uh, and uh, uh, strategies. And uh, I invite also our um, uh, participants to use the Q&A box if you want to pose questions to our speakers. The Q&A box in the Zoom uh, is at the bottom of your controls to speech bubbles symbol. I give now the floor to uh, Esther Bartas. And um, I'm happy to introduce uh, uh, her. She is currently a Marie Curie Research Fellow at the Hannah Arendt Institute for Totalitarism uh, Research at TU Dresden. Uh, and uh, she is a Associate Professor at Edwards Lorand University of Budapest. Her main research field is the post-war social history of Eastern Europe with an emphasis on labor history. Currently, she is engaged in a research which focuses on the newly formed industrial working class and right-wing populism in East Germany and Hungary. Esther, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for, first of all, for the opportunity to speak here. And I would li like to <coughs> build on a bit or elaborate a bit on but uh, both Gala and Kate already mentioned. Uh, uh, one is uh, the, re I mean, one is the refocus on, uh, on East, Eastern Europe, uh, basically with countries such as Hungary and Poland, where we can, I mean, I think we can, we can rightfully state that uh, right-wing or far-right-wing parties are already, have been already in power for a while. And uh, and the, the other issue, which is my recent uh, research, is the behavior of the workers, the industrial working class, 
and uh, um, and uh, of course uh, here I would like to mention that it is not a novel discovery of course that uh, the left uh, um, I mean lost partly this this class and uh, I would like to just to cite uh, Eribon, Didier Eribon's uh, return to Reims who studied in France how uh, uh, in his uh, in his city uh, which was which used to be a, a stronghold for the French Communist Party uh, became uh, uh, I mean the, the workers became the, uh, the supporters of of uh, the National Front that was the first or maybe one of the first the famous books and then uh, David uh, before Eastern Europe uh, I can cite uh, David Ost and for instance Don Carb David Ost argued in 2005 that uh, the workers felt betrayed by the neoliberal intelligentsia and uh, neoliberal capitalism and therefore they uh, turned away from the left liberal coalition and they switched to the to the support of Kaczynski um, but uh, I will I, I I'm trying to 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 give a very wide context about uh, the Eastern Europe and Hungary and then build in my own research with the workers uh, so, uh, in the Hungarian case, uh, uh, I, can, I would like to cite uh, or to, to, to briefly focus on, on the economic, uh, political, and cultures, uh, ideological cultural spheres. Concerning economic uh, spheres, uh, I cite uh, the research of recent research of Gabor Schering uh, or Adam Fabri or Attila Andal. Uh, who argued that authoritarian, in Eastern Europe, authoritarianism, authoritarianism made a coalition with neoliberalism. And uh, in fact, uh, they, they argued and they demonstrated uh, with some statistics that, uh, uh, that Orban, for instance, Orban uh, is a very good friend of grand, great multinational companies, especially German automotive industries. And uh, basically, in, 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 uh, in rhetorics, he is very much anti-neoliberal, <laughs> but in politics, he's in fact, he's in fact, he, he in fact supports neoliberal poli policies. Uh, then uh, concerning politics, uh, uh, Orban was very successful at the beginning to unite uh, from the central left to the far right, every, I mean, every, everything which is, which is anti-communist and anti-liberal. Uh, and, uh, and uh, he um, he he moved basically. Say, I mean, uh, as you can see, also from the European Union, he moved from a central right wing. I mean, originally from a liberal, he was a liberal. Then he moved uh, his party to the central right, and then he moved away again. I right now I think we can call him a far right wing poli uh, politician or authoritarian leader. Uh, so uh, so this is what happened. Uh, uh, politically, and uh, also, uh, I don't. I mean, he he couldn't openly introduce the one-party system, but in fact, he tried to to bribe or break up all other parties. And now there is a side hope because uh, because in the present electoral system, uh, the the opposition is united, uh, which is unfortunate for for the reason because uh, they have to unite from the far from the former far right wing to the far far left everything so that in order to be able to beat Orban. Um, but um, at least yeah, right now the opposition is united, which is the first time since 2010 that this happens. And uh, um, politically he's also he was also very uh, uh, very I mean Orban was very uh, uh, smart smart unfortunately talented to exploit the, for instance, uh, the, the worker, I mean, many, many people, this, I mean, it's a truism now that in Eastern Europe, many people got disappointed with the privatization and the neoliberal shock therapy, therapy which followed the, followed the changes of regime, political, the change of regimes. And this uh, disappointment uh, contributed to, uh, to, to a frustration and anger for many people who felt disappropriated. Uh, and uh, Orban uh, uh, therefore introduced the term illiberalism as, as, uh, as a response or a, as a means to exploit this anger and frustration. Uh, since uh, uh, many, I mean, uh, in my own research, basically, I mean, I interviewed uh, workers both in, uh, in, in Eastern Germany and Hungary in the year 2000, in the 2002, 2003, and later on, 
uh, uh, some 15, uh, 16 years later. And even uh, workers who spoke uh, at the beginning of the 2000s uh, in Hungary were all very bitter about the, the changes of regimes because they felt that the standard of living declined, their factory declined, and uh, they all, the world working class communities uh, got disintegrated and they all expressed a deep disappointment with the changes of regimes. And Orban was very, very keen on very talented uh, to exploit these, uh, these feelings. Then concerning the, the, the cultural ideological spheres uh, here, uh, basically, uh, he, I, I don't want to say he drank Jews because here it's very interesting because uh, after the changes of regimes, both the liberals and the uh, and the uh, Orban's party uh, were uh, agreed on anti-communism, on, on a strong anti-communism. And basically, I mean, uh, and, and anti-fascism survived for a while, but again, uh, there is a new uh, uh, memory of politics in which attempt is made to uh, criminalize Soviet Union as such, to make a, uh, to, uh, to uh, make a parallel between Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, even with the argument that after all the Nazi Germany was a bit better and uh, basically focus on uh, isolate Holocaust from the global context. So still, I mean, still preserve the memory of Holocaust, but, but, uh, but tear, uh, separate it from the global context. And uh, um, uh, again, uh, I use uh, the term uh, co uh, uh, coined by Margaret Feischmidt and Peter Hervik, mainstreaming the extreme. It was an article which they, which they wrote together. And here they argued that, uh, and here I would like to, 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 to um, prove it with my own research that whereas at the, at the beginning of 2000s, workers were obviously, I mean, they might have harbored anti-Roma or other uh, racist sentiments, but they did not mention it openly. Whereas in the Nobel research, uh, younger workers, uh, they, they were very keen on, uh, on using these culturalist essential arguments against migrants, against, especially against Roma people, uh, and even in group discussions. So they wanted to stress that they belong to the majority society. There was no longer shame about this. Uh, that uh, and using all the all the stereotypes like welfare dependent gypsies, crime, uh, gypsy crime, and so on and so on, and other culturalist uh, um, uh, arguments. Uh, to conclude, just one sentence. Uh, uh, the, the conclusion. I mean, again, even Gabo Shering's uh, research uh, confirmed this. Uh, uh, because uh, in his book, uh, in his recent book, there is a whole chapter focusing on his own working class research uh, that uh, the workers basically in, in Eastern, I think, I think this can be generalized to the whole Eastern Europe, uh, but certainly in the Hungarian case, we have strong evidence that uh, uh, workers, uh, uh, I mean, the class category has become so much discredited and criminalized that work, I mean, no longer workers identify as workers or blue collar workers or class or whatever. So they have no other means to express their, the belonging, their belonging to the majority society than this cultural uh, essential agreements that they are Hungarians, they are, uh, they are, they are good, they are non-Gypsies, they are white people and so they are not migrants and so on and so on. And one very last uh, question that I <laughs> address with Mama Zawa Santos is the family issue. Uh, I think here, here I mean, I, my, my own research suggested that even under state socialism, in spite of all efforts of the Communist Party to increase gender equality, Hungary remained a very conservative country in many ways. And uh, basically our, our communist leader Kadar made a, a concession to this family, the centrality of the, of the old fashioned conservative family. And in fact, Orban uh, exploits again uh, this uh, traditionally conservative and patriarchic uh, family and gender model, roles and models. For instance, the recent uh, law against the criminalization of LMBTQ, I think uh, it's, uh, it, it, is, it, is all also, it, it can be also interpreted as a means, first of all, to divide the opposition, and second, to, uh, to, to appeal to this old tradition of many Hungarians deeply ingrained uh, conservative uh, and patriarchal feelings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esther, for this interesting insight to, to the Hungarian 
reality and and uh, political landscape and pointing out also some um, general um, uh, points and observations uh, on the far right. We will come back in a second round, um, I, I guess, in the discussion also to many points you made. I give now the floor to Walter Bayer. Uh, he holds a doctorate in economy, was national chairman of the Communist Party of Austria uh, from 94 to 2006, and he was an editor of the Austrian weekly Volksstimme, and from 2007 until 2020, has been uh, the political coordinator of the network Transform Europe. Uh, Walter, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Uh, when preparing uh, this contribution, I remembered the sigh of relief uh, after the European elections of 2019. Uh, indeed, the far right parties underperformed the general expectations. Commentators took comfort in the fact that the dramatic losses suffered by the conservatives and social democrats were compensated by liberals and the greens. So everything uh, seemed under control. After the victory of Emmanuel Macron at the French presidential elections over Marine Le Pen that happened in 2017, and with this result of the European elections, it seemed that the sore of the far right uh, had been broken. However, the hardcore uh, right uh, around uh, Le Pen, Salvini, and the German AFD managed, though, to put together a group of 73 MEPs out of 711, a fact which again could be comfortably explained as the result of the merging with the other far right group, uh, Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy. Unfortunately, the qualitative aspect of the merger had been uh, hardly noticed. In fact, it did not mean only a consolidation in organizational terms, which means a unified group with a unified uh, uh, leadership, but also the ideological victory of the hardcore of the former European um, of uh, nation and freedom group. What happened since then uh, in only a couple of words. The Brexit, whatever else it means, it has demonstrated the vulnerability of, Europe integra of European integration in the face of nationalistic populism. In various countries, and this was already mentioned, the so-called cordon sanitaire collapsed and parties of the far right managed to become respected coalition partners, prefer preferably of conservative parties. And even in the cases where they failed drastically uh, because of corruption and or of incompetence, as it was the case in Austria, they managed to recover after a short period of time, thus demonstrating that their fate does not depend on their practical achievements, but rather on the support of big media and the general ideological climate which has shifted so drastically towards the right. Meanwhile, the right national governments in Poland uh, and Hungary <coughs> attack not only domestically liberal democracy, human rights of minorities and women's uh, equality, but manage increasingly to hijack the European agenda as they have succeeded with regard to migration and border politics. The most recent advance in their strategy in their strategy has been achieved only Friday last week when leaders of 16 parties signed a so-called declaration for the future of, of Europe, laying the foundation for cooperation also on the level of the European Parliament. Hungary's Orban, Poland's Kaczynski's, Italy's Salvini, Marine Le Pen from France, 
the president of the Vox Party from Spain, Abascal Conde, the leader of the Flams Bloc, of the Finns Party, the Danish People's Party, and of course the FPÖ from Austria. Since even this powerful merger does not exhaust the full potential of the nationalists, one could gauge the number of seats to which they can grow between 120 and 130, which would make them the second largest group in the European Parliament. From a qualitative point of view, it's again the program of the hardcore group, the former Europe of Nations and Freedom, which provides the content and the strategy of this joint declaration. Without directly wholesale opposing the EU, not even questioning the treaties, it asserts that the current politics of the EU strive to create a European superstate, to destruct or cancel European traditions, to transform basic social institutions and moral principles, and to strip the European nations of the right to exercise their legitimate sovereign powers. In contrast, the far right wants to defend the Judeo-Christian tradition of Europe, by the way, a cultural racist constructions which you find also in the programs of the respected conservative right. And first and foremost, Europe must remain a community of sovereign free nations protected by mechanism, mechanisms, included the participation of the National Constitutional Court, which is an obvious reference to the German Constitutional Court, which last year issued a sentence arrogating its presidents in uh, interpreting even European law. Why is this declaration so interesting? A, because it's a very intelligently, thoroughly composed proposal for further permeating the mainstream of European politics, being compatible with the agenda of the European conservatives, while at the same time upholding the genuine ultra-right visions of racism, historic revisionism, and white supremacy. In this sense, it's a real serious project of hegemony. What we see here is a teaching play about what Antonio Gramsci named a war of position, meaning the gradual advancing, conquering of positions and using them as the basis for new advances. B, when the far right made its appearance on the European stage, many observers said, well, this is unpleasant, but it's not a threat. These guys are nationalists. How can they ever become a unified international European agent? The paradox of a nationalist, nationalist international is resolved in that conflicting nationalisms of moderate and radical parties of the right have found a common vanishing point in their opposition to European integration. My final uh, remark, what we need is a comprehensive and realistic evaluation of this old and new enemy, acknowledging the seriousness of the strategic project it represents as an alternative to the still prevailing neoliberal hegemony. The core value of the far right proposals are authoritarian collectivism, nationalism, and white supremacism codified as the Judeo Christian heritage, which they see under threat. Of course, uh, the rise of this far right is not irresistible. First, because as the Hungarian Austrian historian Karl Polanyi observed in the 20s and 30s of the last century, the ascent of the far right to power is dependent on the reason and the depth of the crisis, which might or might not induce relevant circles of the capitalist elites to accept or reject their authoritarian project. Second, because it still has to compete with neoliberalism, which by no means is powerless and also tries to adapt to the crisis, e.g. 
uh, for example, by integrating or creating new parties or integrating parties like the Greens in its governing system. Thirdly and foremost, it depends on the socialist left. Of course, the socialist left competes with the far right in elections, yet this is far from being enough. The critical point is to understand that, the authoritar that authoritarian neoliberalism um, and neo-fascism are not pathological, pathological phenomena emerging from the lower classes, but rather the expression of the decaying ideology of neoliberalism. That means we are not only competing on the level of institutionalized politics, but also on the intellectual and cultural level in interpreting the crisis. And this has, of course, a European dimension. It's obvious that the European Union can not continue in a neoliberal and undemocratic way. What is the alternative? Do we want a Europe torn apart through competing nationalisms? Do we want a Europe based on the idea of white supremacy, competing with other superpowers militarily and allying with white supremacies in the United States? with closed borders, ignoring or downplaying the ecological crisis? Or do we want a progressive, a democratic and solidaristic Europe, which concept needs still to be drawn up and agreed among the parties of the left, the trade unions and the ecological and social movement. Entering in this huge intellectual and cultural struggle is the prerequisite to bar the far right and let's call a spade a spade, the neo-fascism from power. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Walter, for this comprehensive and interesting uh, overview and also insights to the new developments on the European uh, level and the European unions, um, far right parties, and also the um, uh, strategic outlook. I give um, now uh, in a second round, the floor to uh, the speakers. Uh, we have one question in the Q&A so far, um, and we will tackle it uh, after the second round. It's uh, also on uh, Hungary. Uh, I give the floor again to Gala, please. Gala, uh, you can take the floor also to comment or reply on what your fellow uh, co-speakers have said, of course. Franz was also mentioned uh, from uh, Kate and Esther, but also uh, uh, to go again to um, uh, the strategic outlooks. Thank you, Gala, Barbara. Um, yes, thank you, Kate, for mentioning uh, the last uh, regional elections. Um, it's, it's. Uh, um, I think we need to talk about it. Um, in spite of a campaign uh, totally wired on the question of security, uh, even if it is not a regional uh, jurisdiction, security is not a regional question, and yet all the campaign was around the question of security. Um, in spite of this campaign uh, that could have uh, made the Rassemblement National in a very good position, uh, they have lost more than half or, of their voters uh, compared to the last regional elections. Um, this year they had around 3 million voters and in 2015 uh, around 6 million. So the question would be, um, is it a sign of a decline of the far right or is it just um, a loss of mobilization? Uh, the participation rate was not higher than 32% uh, and the far right voters are not known to be strongly mobilized at the presidential elections and less to other elections. So th th this question uh, is important. And also as uh, Walter and Kate mentioned, uh, this bad result for the far right uh, can't make us deny the cultural victory 
uh, of many of the far right uh, thematics, such as uh, nationalism. This cultural victory uh, is to be seen, of course, in the media, but it's also to be seen in the left uh, camp, uh, where some political uh, leaders um, adopt uh, nationalist rhetoric, uh, such as Manuel Valls, of course, the, the, the not a very good example because he's um, uh, very special, but Manuel Valls has uh, a very dangerous image of immigrants, a very dangerous image of a uh, Muslim, um, and he is from the Socialist Party. So th there, there, there's not any more um, complex of adopting nationalist uh, uh, rhetoric and um, chasing for the far right votes, uh, even in the left, is something that is happening. So this, uh, in my opinion, testify of the, the far right uh, cultural victory. Yet uh, the result of the, the regional election can give hope because they show uh, that we, as the progressive camp, uh, we are not sentenced to choose between the bad and the worst. Uh, um, it shows that uh, a strong proposition uh, from the left uh, can be imagined and can be carried. Um, and we don't have to live in this duality between liberal and uh, far right. So this, this, I would like to end on this touch of hope for this uh, uh, election. Um, regarding the, 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 the strategic uh, opportunities, uh, and to fight this cultural uh, fight that they operate with very, very uh, solid uh, basis. I remember uh, two years ago, uh, it was a conference of the right. So really the part between the conservative, the liberal right and the far right. Uh, and it was led by uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen, the niece of uh, Marine Le Pen, and was gathering all this people from the, 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 the business, um, business parts, political, mediatic, a, a very scary coalition. And uh, in the speech of opening speech, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen mentioned Gramsci and the cultural victory, the cultural hegemony. Um, they are in this strategy uh, and they operate it with um, success. Uh, she has a school, they have uh, very good positions within the media. Um, so we have to fight them uh, on the same field. Um, I think that what uh, the work that we are doing with Transform, um, the work of uh, creating a coalition of alternative media um, can be a very good uh, response to that. Also another project uh, that to me has, can have very strong impact um, would be to monitor the far right. Many, many people have this activity of monitoring uh, the far right uh, and we, with Transform, we aim at um, gathering all these people, all, all these groups uh, who make a work of monitoring the far right. Uh, these activity are very, Various uh, from the anti-fascism group who identify uh, radical violent groups, uh, from groups um, organization uh, who identify the international networks of the far right, international major or coalition they built, uh, and they're, they're linked to a violent group. As Transform, I think um, we would love to help uh, to propose to join forces by proposing a platform for all these people to meet, uh, to exchange practices uh, and centralize information. Also uh, about what uh, Walter um, mentioned, uh, to have a working group on the far right MEP group uh, activity to, 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 to have strong arguments on the liberal policies that uh, they vote for, be, be, be very aware of every vote uh, the MEP uh, international far right group uh, work on the, the European Assembly. Um, so this, in my opinion, would have strong impact, and I would be very happy to 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 work with all the people who 
who have this monitoring activity, very important uh, monitoring activity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gala. And uh, uh, on the, the cultural victory or hegemony that you mentioned by the far right, um, and uh, how to challenge it. Uh, thanks also for the propositions, the, the media, the cultural field, and um, taking up an idea that uh, was uh, also shared at the No Passaran conference uh, that Kate will now uh, soon talk about. Um, we want to uh, also um, share the um, very um, concrete cultural uh, activities. And we will show uh, after this um, uh, web seminar, uh, a short film of a performance of um, uh, an Austrian uh, theater group, uh, Sprung Wien, uh, who did uh, perform uh, Maxim Gorky's uh, um, uh, Nachtasyl. And uh, so if you have time after this uh, webinar, you can still stay and uh, watch this 18 minute uh, short film uh, with uh, pieces of the performance. Um, I give now the floor uh, to Kate, please. Thanks. Thanks very much. That, that was incredibly interesting. So thanks to my fellow <laughs> contributors, um, a huge amount to, to think about. Um, as, as Barbara mentioned, uh, two years ago, we held a No Pass Around conference um, in London. We had uh, major participation from across Europe. I think probably the largest um, delegation came from Hungary, in fact, Esther. We had many, many young people who at that time, two years ago, you know, they were very, very involved in the protests that were going on there around education and, and so on. Um, and then we were planning to hold uh, a second in-person conference early this year in Berlin, but the pandemic, of course, got in the way. And as Barbara said, we moved to uh, some online events. But obviously, although online is good <laughs> um, and you can get people internationally together, you know, in, in a very easy way. Nevertheless, the, the opportunity by in-person um, events to have networking and to have longer, more in-depth discussions and batting ideas around and so on, that's that's kind of irreplaceable. Um, so we're very much hoping to um, have the Berlin event next spring. And in fact, tomorrow I've got a meeting with with um, Pete comrades from d -Linka to look at you know, exactly where, when, and, and the programme and so on. So the working group, um, the Fighting the Far Right working group of the European Left Party is taking the lead on this, and Transform is obviously uh, very supportive of uh, the project. But if people have ideas or want to make suggestions, you know, we're very open um, because there are so many different uh, aspects to this. And in fact, that was that was one of the things that we really took out uh, away from the London conference, that there are so many different levels on which the far right operates. And uh, as we've said, it can be in government or on the street. And we've seen increasing violence and even terrorist actions uh, from the far right. And the pro-Trump attack on the US Congress was only the most prominent example. So that kind of diversity of uh, manifestations of the far right is something that we have to be very alert to. Um, and also the fact, I think Walter touched on this as well, that they have their core messaging, they have the kind of core elements on which they have traditionally built their, their support. So anti-immigrant, ultra-nationalist, racist, socially conservative, and so on. But over the last five years, we have seen that narrative expand ideologically to include a strong anti-elite messaging, uh, kind of radical cultural conservatism, promotion of fake news and conspiracy theories, of course, that's a very major aspect of this, and a dangerous anti-expert, anti-science position, which of course has been disastrous during the pandemic. I mean, maybe it's the same everywhere, we, but we have very strong anti-vax, um, anti-lockdown um, demonstrations and positions led 
um, led by the far right. So that that whole thing and you know culture wars and so on. This is absolutely central to the work uh, that we have to do. And I very much agree with the points that Walter made in his contribution around the kind of the intellectual and and cultural debates and contestation that needs to go on. So the movement which confronts the far right uh, also has to operate on many different levels of what as well. And what we found when we were putting the first No Pass Around conference together was how many, once we made it public, we got so many organisations coming to us and saying, we want to support the conference, we want to participate, and coming from many, many different perspectives and many different ways of organising. So being open to new coalitions, coalitions and alliances is absolutely fundamental. And particularly, I'm saying this from what we're seeing in Britain, but I'm sure it's the same across Europe, young people are now increasingly left wing um, and politicized on a whole range of issues, you know, in a very progressive way. I mean, the young demographic in, in Britain is streets ahead in terms of opposing the bad things that are coming from the government, opposing racism, opposing Islamophobia, supporting Palestine, all, all kinds of progressive things, the young people are there. And of course, they are developing their own ways of working and existing established organisations. We may think we know how to do it, you know, <laughs> um, but we need to be very open and respectful of those new developments and those new ways of organising, because when it comes down to it, you know, it's not as if we've got 100% success rate doing things the way we've always done them. So we have to be very, very open, but also recognising um, the positive things from the way we work as well. And just, um, I think uh, Gala mentioned this as well, you know, about media um, and using media communications in an effective way. And this is a huge challenge for the left um, and in many cases, the far right is highly technologized and social media is one of the chief vehicles for its political advance. It's far ahead, probably, of all of the left. I mean, maybe, you know, in the US, there's been better development around the progressive movement of the use of social media and um, uh, comms technology and so on. But I mean, it's like we are 20 years behind, it seems to me, <laughs> a lot of what uh, the far right is doing in terms of, of social media. It needs to be discussed and developed as a matter of extreme urgency, because I think we do fantastic stuff. We have great meetings, really interesting debates, but it's like it's not out there you know, because we are not pushing it out there in effective ways, you know, um, not even at the most basic levels of social media. And I don't mean to be discourteous to anyone because, you know, we have the same problem, probably worse in Britain than elsewhere, but it's something we really need to, to get ahead of. And then um, finally, um, finally, uh, Barbara, just to say, you know, about the internationalization of the far right. This is again something that conference addressed really a lot. I mean, it, it took place during the Trump presidency two years ago, but um, nevertheless, the far right in any case has become increasingly internationalized. It's well funded and organized. Um, and even though Trump's gone, Steve Bannon was ousted and he was one of the main perpetrators of the internationalization. Nevertheless, that internationalization uh, will be continuing from the far right. So I think the main, if I had to identify one of the main, the main takeaway from the No Pass Around conference was the need for the left to work and plan together internationally on far more effectively to confront um, the right, because we all know these are not problems that we can, can be solved on a national level. And the way we work together has to be uh, really, really significantly increased. And then that will enable the left and progressive forces to present our alternative vision and policies far more coherently, and also with confidence and militancy as well. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you very much, Kate. And um, um, yeah, we're looking forward to the Berlin conference and uh, hope to, to meet then physical and, and exchange and um, uh, analyze uh, together and uh, find 
common strategies there also. And uh, I give the floor now to Esther, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I fully agree with Gala and Kate uh, in the points, especially the Gramsci's uh, cultural hege hege hegemony. And I would like to add the Eastern European, maybe a bit Eastern European perspective that now uh, it can be, of course, contradicted, but uh, uh, I would argue that uh, Veras in 1989, uh, 1989 uh, many Western left wings, even left wing thinkers, or uh, thought that uh, that uh, that not like with Fukuyama that the end of history came, but certainly they expected uh, some positive um, um, future for Eastern Europe and for the left. And in fact, now I think we can uh, we can argue that the end of the Soviet Union was a was a blow to the global left in one way or another. So uh, even so, of course, uh, the really existing social, actually existing socialism was not the, the socialism which was, which was, uh, uh, which was originally envisaged. Uh, uh, still, uh, we did basically Europe's communist parties uh, almost collapsed or weakened. The social democratic parties also lost support, and. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, just the Eastern European countries, basically what is going on, maybe one of the most reaction, reactionary country, reactionarist countries, Hungary, uh, is the complete criminalization of all left. Not just anti-communism, but the criminalization of, of any, any left-wing ideas. So one thing that I would stress is to, of course, not to, not to bless the actual existing socialism, but certainly get it to know more be much better and draw lessons from what has happened in Eastern Europe in this during these 70 or, uh, year, or, or years in the Soviet Union. And here I would like to mention a conference organized by Attila Meleg, an international conference and supported by uh, Transform and Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And this conference tried to explore the non-capitalist mixed economies. Uh, so not not just the Stanis type of what what uh, what uh, uh, what we of course uh, should criticize, but also some other alternatives. So I think it's very important for the global left to come up with uh, viable alternatives, and also to 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 accept certain historical traditions, even if um, the Soviet Union's hist Soviet history was not a success story in many aspects. Uh, still, it was an experiment which has to be taken into account. I, I would I would argue, and uh, then to the to the so so in order to 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 be able to attract or um, back the people like workers and so on, they they should need they should need to see a viable alternative to nationalism, xenophobia, and all these far right solving solutions. And what I would also consider uh, important. Uh, I think it's true. I mean, I, my, my main experience comes from Hungary, but also in, in Germany, this is the same experience which I had, that there is a growing distance between workers and intelligentsia. So, uh, so there are, in the at the beginning of the 2000s, it was very easy to find interview partners. No, it's not, not the case anymore. So workers simply don't want to talk to intellectuals about their experience or, or whatever. So, so my, my feeling is that the social distance has increased or the social mistrust rather. Uh, and that's, that makes it more of the more difficult. And the third thing that I would, I would argue is the, uh, the, what Kate already mentioned, the political education, the political uh, building in German, uh, that this used to be very important alongside the anti-fascist anti tradition. And now there is a global attack on human, against human capital. Uh, or against humanists in general, which you can see, like in England, there are uh, the, in the UK there are further cuts on the humanistic uh, faculties. Uh, in Eastern Europe, I mean, Orban is explicitly they express his his open contempt for for any humanist tradition, and uh, uh, and uh, concerning the anti-fascist tradition, uh, it's again. Uh, 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 but something which should be back in mainstreamized uh, because it's again something that whereas Holocaust is important uh, uh, for Europe, it is still becoming more and more ethnicized. Like it's possible for Orban to make a, be, be, to be a great friend of Netanyahu, even so at home he's playing a double card 
so a bit of anti-Semitic, but a bit of not, and, and also all over that. And uh, I think uh, with the criminalization of the Soviet Union, uh, it is, the basis of this anti-fascist tradition has been weakened. Because uh, whatever happened before and after, the Soviet, the Soviet Union was an ally of the, of the Western powers. And uh, it had a share uh, on overcoming the Nazi Germany. And once the whole thing is questioned or weakened or whatever, I think it's, uh, uh, it weakens the whole anti-fascist coalition tradition. And I'm sorry, I got questions, but I must admit I don't speak French. <laughs> so I, I, I don't understand the question, but it's, uh, sorry. <laughs> we will translate, uh, okay, our you. support translated it already. Uh, but I give the floor to Walter before, and then we come to the Q&A round. And I still ask um, all the participants, please use the Q&A box for any questions you might have. You can use any language you no, you can use French, Spanish, and English, uh, and uh, our trans uh, interpreters are so friendly to translate it. Walter, please. Uh, I think there are two dangers in this discussion. One is um, the underestimation of the problem. Uh, uh, I uh, follow this discussion now for almost seven 20 years, let's say 20 years. For example, when in 2014, um, the European Parliament was constituted, people said, well, they have 40 seats in the European Parliament. They are split in three groups. Uh, they never will be able to come up with a common uh, agenda. Even then, if you counted together the number of seats who would be eligible for a far right group in the European Parliament, you come almost to the same number of seats as now uh, are supposed to join in the joint declaration. What does that mean? It means that, uh, so to say, there always is a difference uh, between the different levels of institutionalizing politics. Um, and um, the project of the far right is a long-term project. It's not meant we go for the next elections and then we have the majority here and there. It's meant for structurally, fundamentally change the content, the political, cultural and social content uh, of Europe composed of nation states and of the European Union, which is uh, thought as being the, uh, the, fed, the, the combination of independent states. And this difference in levels uh, must be considered in any context. Uh, and that is the second danger. Uh, we are uh, in danger uh, at the same time to underestimate the opposing forces. Uh, if we say, for example, um, they managed to intrude uh, the uh, agenda of the mainstream parties with their uh, racist proposals. True, but that is not hegemony. Because the other side of hegemony is that we have across all European countries huge movements which are opposing racism, which are expressing solidarity with the migrants. And the struggle is still on. And anti-Muslim racism is an instrument in this struggle. And again, what happens on the level of people does not express properly and directly on the level of institutional politics. Austria, for example, we had a couple of years ago presidential elections. It took us three tries in order to come up with a result. The result was that 55% of the Austrians voted for a green candidate, mainly because they were opposing the FPÖ and the racist agenda which they had. Nine years later, a government was, for, was formed exactly of the FPÖ and the Conservative Party. Although half of the Conservative Party, uh, half of the electorate of the Conservative Party voted for the progressive president. What does this tell us? It tells us that only half of the truth lies in what people vote for, and the other part of the truth lies in what the elites decide on behalf of the people. And I think we must understand this paradox of liberal parliamentary democracy. 
And the second message which I want to convey uh, concerns uh, the cultural and the intellectual uh, field. I fully uh, agree with uh, Kate that, so to say, this anti-expert discourse now being um, promoted also by uh, by the pandemic and the and the anti vax movements uh, is important. I would say not so much in terms of being a part of the ideological message of the far right parties, but in creating the breeding ground of irrationalism, which then is part of the new uh, right instrument of shaping public public consciousness. Uh, but at the same time, this is also dialectic because this at the same time provides the possibility of us to unite with progressive intellectuals and even with progressive uh, natural science, which definitely is not a core group uh, addressed by the left so far. So um, in one word, uh, I'm very happy that we now more apply a Gramscian um, instruments in analyzing the problem. But if we do it, we must do it uh, very uh, precisely. We don't have yet in the most of the countries um, a, a, a neo-fascist hegemony. In some of the countries, the neo-fascists rely, for example, on a coalition with the reactionary part of the Catholic Church. In other parts of Europe, uh, the uh, opposition against the far right is based on a, a mass sentiment within the Catholic Church that they don't want these anti-humanistic ideologies to prevail in their countries. So things are very complicated. There are chances, there are opportunities, but at the same time, it's a huge challenge for the left to come up not only with political proposal and political alternative, but also with a universalistic cosmopolitan interpretation uh, of the capitalist crisis of today. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. Uh, we have now two questions um, in the Q&A. Uh, and I might also add uh, one or two questions. Uh, the first one goes to uh, Esther. Uh, she asks about the um, Museum of Terrors that has been created uh, since 2000 by Orban and the uh, plus uh, the Liberty Place, Liberty Square um, in, that falsified uh, history. I think it's the a square in, in Budapest in 2013. Could you... Um, tell a little bit about this and about your opinion on this. And I would have also a question to you, Esther, um, namely you mentioned the um, broad coalition against Orban that includes also the far right. Could you explain a little bit more on this also, please? Um, yeah, and um, maybe I come to the second question afterwards, which is also a very interesting question. Thank you very much. So to the uh, to the terror 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 house. Uh, well, firstly, it, it is not unique in Hungary. In the Baltic states, similar terror houses were created. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, and maybe Hungary is the most reaction, reactionary country out of all of these. But uh, but still, it's not unique in many ways. And uh, uh, and. Uh, of course, it is an attempt on behalf of the right-wing government of Orban uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, change the memory, historical historical memory uh, of socialism and criminalize socialism. And uh, basically, it is supposed to to be a museum on both the fascist era of Hungary and uh, uh, and the communist era. And, but basically, I think one or two rooms is devoted to the fascist, and all the rest is about <laughs> for the communist. <laughs> so it's it is quite telling. And uh, there is even a scene when the when the fascists uh, uh, read, I mean, changes the clothes, and then they become communists. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, as said, uh, it is part of an of a more general attempt to criminalize. Uh, not only state socialism, but also the whole left. 
uh, and why uh, i mean there was not real resistance to that uh, because uh, uh, because uh, i must admit that at, at that stage the liberals agreed with the far right uh, with the right wing uh, at that time right wing uh, policies of orban that uh, that uh, the communists uh, somehow um, should be forgotten or should be uh, should be left out of the hungarian historical historical memory uh, so therefore they accepted the terror museum uh, and uh, there was no real resistance to to the to the cross construction whereas the the other statue uh, on the on the square of liberty which uh, uh, which uh, describes Hungary as a victim of both Nazi Germany and uh, the Soviet Union, uh, which is a complete falsification, of course, because because Hungary, in fact, was the last before many reasons for the last ally of Hitler, and the Holocaust couldn't have taken place without the assistance of the Hungarian authorities and gendarmerie. And uh, there's a good movie on that, 1945 which depicts uh, uh, the Hungarian share of guilt. Uh, it, uh, the story is that two Jews return to a village, Hungarian village, and it turns out that it basically the whole village, including the Catholic priest, participated in the persecution and the robbing of the Jews from their, from their property. And uh, so I think there are two currents. There is a, an attempt to 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 face the historical uh, reality and draw some lessons from it, uh, but the overall opinion uh, of the government uh, is that uh, that uh, Hungary should be seen as a victim, yes, both of both uh, dictatorships, and thereby the Hungarian people are freed, uh, liberated from the guilt. And of course, many people prefer this interpretation to the. To the to the guilty hunger <laughs> or to the to the to, to the to the to the face to facing with the truth and uh, uh, here and uh, um, and uh, so therefore even so there are may, there are intellectual attempts to 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 uh, unmask the historical truth uh, there is a uh, a strong attempt on behalf of this right-wing conservative and other forces, nationalistic forces, to whitewash the Hungarian Hungary role, Hungary's role in these tragic events, and basically reinterpret anti-fascism in many ways. The other question, um, so I said that Orban move originally was liberal, supported by George Soros, then in the 1994, uh, 1993, 1994, he shifted his party from the liber from a left left liberal to a central right, and in the recent years he moved to the far right. And uh, uh, um, Job, I mean, there was a, uh, I mean, as I said, Orban was originally central, called its party central right, and there was an even more nationalistic attempt starting from the early 90s, led by Churka, uh, the party of Hungarian. Uh, justice uh, and life, uh, which was openly anti-Semitic and uh, and uh, um, collected the most nationalistic, most revisionist, most reactionary forces. At that time, Orban was not one of them, uh, but later he he changed, as said, and uh, even in the 2006, this uh, this party was transformed to a younger uh, uh, force. Uh, the your big bet, the better that was the name, and at that time they were even more nationalistic than Orban. But with the shift of Orban, uh, uh, of moving from the central right to the far right, uh, your big in fact became more tame, and now it is trying to be, uh, um, I mean, to be to present itself as a, as a moderate right wing party. So basically, Orban uh, uh, succeeded to to to. Uh, to to uh, um, to I don't know sorry so I succeeded to seduce the or to collect the 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 the, the to recruit this originally far very far right wing nationalistics to his own camp that's the story. Thank you, Esther, and you mentioned in your. 
um, introduction that now there is a broad coalition against Fides um, being built. Yes, basically all forces starting from this Yobik, which is now present, which now presents itself as a, as a moderate right wing party, uh, going to the discredited Socialist Party, which succeeded to lose lots of voters, and now they are they used to be ruling party uh, in the past, and now I think they have less than five percent. <laughs> It is a very sad development. That's a socialist party. There's another uh, left, so-called left-wing, but neoliberal party led by Yu uh, Chang, uh, which seems to be the most popular with 10, 15 percent. And there is another party, young, newly uh, established party, uh, Momentum, uh, which is again neoliberal, but at least democratic. So, of course, it's self-democratic. So the, the, the left, the true left, has absolutely no, I mean, uh, there, is a, there are some parties, but they score less than 1%. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the insight and the explanation. And uh, the second question we have uh, from uh, the, uh, from a participant, from Stephen Pantifo, uh, is uh, about, um, the improvement of um, social conditions, whether they uh, could dissolve uh, the right movements. Uh, so the the very old question, I think, and I, I guess that all of you could uh, say something on it. Uh, I don't know what, who wants to take the floor. I saw that Gala started to answer in the written form. So Gala? Uh, no, I, I don't, but uh, I can I can try to 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 answer. Um, uh, many many studies focus on the the origin or the explanation of the the far right vote or the far right uh, participation uh, to far right movements. Um, uh, the, the, I think the 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 role of the of precariousness. Uh, is very explanatory to understand why people vote for the far right. Uh, the lack of social link also is um, something that um, all uh, researchers or political leaders agree on. Uh, the enemy uh, remains a very explanatory uh, characteristic of far right voters, and therefore um, a strong state uh, who would um, prevent uh, vulnerable uh, workers to fall into uh, precarity or um, a strong state who would uh, prevent um, companies, liberal uh, companies to um, make a competition, stage a competition between a uh, worker, French worker, um, national worker and uh, a more a cheaper or a more flexible uh, worker, immigrant worker. Um, this is um, a narrative that the, the, the far right uses a lot, and it works since uh, materialist conditions uh, make this, um, this narrative uh, believable because people live uh, this precarity and have this feeling of uh, being uh, seeing their jobs stolen uh, by immigrants. Th th this narrative have, has a very strong penetration uh inside the the, the 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 working class i think um also uh, a state that would uh have uh this um equal geographical implementation um to prevent uh rural uh, areas or suburban uh, areas to be um to have a, a huge lack of public services uh cities where the only um, the only state, the only, um, yes, the, 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 the only public, uh, public uh, service is uh, a police office, uh, no hospital, no school, no um, social, cultural uh, place where people can gather and where social link. Uh, so, yes, uh, I think the, the, the role of the state is uh, absolutely, uh, absolute necessity and um, 
left uh, responsible uh, program uh, has to have to be yeah very serious on the question of the state. Thank you, Gala. We have a third question. Um, and, and thanks also to the interpreters for translating it. Uh, the question is, I would like to ask whether to counter the cultural hegemony of the right, which as Walter mentioned, is not so um, uh, uncontested uh, to, and not so accepted yet, which is now th seen throughout Europe. Uh, it is not necessary to start again from the composition of the class beyond wage labor, but without neglecting it. So I think this goes also in direction of the studies Espas Max did to, to look at the composition of the voters and the class composition of the voters of, of the right. I don't know, Gala, if you also want to take the floor on this or if anyone mm. is of the speakers. I, I can Gala, yes. give, the, give the floor to someone else. Uh, but yes, I, I, I think what I said before about the precariousness uh, is uh, very important. Actually, um, studies who try to, 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 to focus here yeah, on the, the explanation of the far right uh, could oppose uh, materialist ones uh, focus on the, the class condition uh, that provoke uh, this electoral choice, but they, they are facing strong difficulties since, uh, as uh, Esther mentioned, uh, the, 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 the left lost a, a huge part of the, the working class and in order to not fall into the theory of the, the radical left electorate and far right electorate to be very similar. Uh, the materialist uh, studies uh, have to, to, to become more and more precise and also with the transformation of work uh, that is creating a very various um, experience of working. We see with the, the, the neoliberalism, it's um, in, in the territory of France, for example, um, the, 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 the workers who was uh, industrial workers are now, um, they, 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 they are transformed by the neoliberalism. And um, now the, the, the study has to, to, to have a, a strong precision because we are more on the, um, the, 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 how to say, <clears throat> the logistic, uh, um, field of work uh, and very often it's not uh, very big companies it's small companies local companies and uh, the, 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 the structure of the, the worker and the capitalist uh, boss is very uh, it's, it's not the same the same um, um, how to say um, I think the, the, the materialist approach uh, remains very, very relevant to, to understand the far right votes, but it has, it, it has to, 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 to be so precise because every uh, worker has a, a, a different work experience, and yet it is difficult to, 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 to see uh, which work experience provoke um, a far right vote. Um, so this is the, the, the difficulty for materialist approach. Um, the post-materialist approach focus on um, the vote as the expression of an emotion. Uh, so anger or scare. Um, I think the, the, this uh, approach are insufficient because um, every vote has uh, emotion. Uh, motivation and uh, taking the far right vote as the only vote who would be um, casted on emotion uh, gives him uh, this speciality that uh, to me uh, prevents to see that neoliberalism, capitalism produces um, materialist uh, conditions uh, that provoke this emotion that provoke the fact of believing that immigrants are here to steal your work. Um, so this uh, emotional approach uh, to me is um, failing 
to, 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 to see the, the, the role of the economical structure and how it is shaped. Thank you very much. Walter, please. Yes, I think, uh, I think the key word in this context is interpretation. Um, because if you look at the working conditions, um, which now emerge in today's capitalism, they are in many respects comparable to the working conditions of the 19th century. Without any social security, you can be dismissed from one day to the other. You cannot plan your future, uh, neither you can plan the future of your kids. I mean, this precariousness, not only as a, so to say, uh, uh, an issue of, uh, of uh, social laws, but precariousness as a state of, uh, of existence and the state of mind. Um, uh, that is what we then had and what through a hundred years uh, uh, struggle could be pushed back by decommodifying the, the working relations. But the problem to which I want to draw your attention is that in the 19th century, this state of precariousness created uh, the labor movement and the socialist movement. So uh, we must explain uh, why at this time, at least for the moment, it seems uh, to uh, foster uh, the far right and reactionary patterns of explanation. And here I think is the point of interpretation. We must be as honest uh, to us uh, as far as to say that the left interpretation, which by the way is not a narrative, which is an analysis, uh, not sufficient is sufficiently strong to convince people of uh, an alternative. And that also concerns the issue of class. I mean, obviously there is a ruling class, but whenever there is a ruling class, there must be an exploited and a suppressed class. Uh, so why does uh, the suppressed class perceive itself not as a class, but rather as a nation, as a religious community, uh, as a neighborhood? And again, it's an issue of interpretation and of research. I miss, for example, a book which would um, analyze uh, how um, surplus value is created under the condition of digital neoliberalism. We have many books describing the new legal forms, platform economy, geek economy, but there are very few books who really try to connect these positivistic, empiristic observations with a capital theory uh, describing or analyzing how that what you sell allegedly individually to a capitalist turns into sur surplus value and accumulation. But this is the precondition of developing class consciousness beyond the very different um, uh, work experiences which people have and which are in the foreground and more or less push them into the direction of competition uh, with one another. And in this uh, respect, the last sentence, um, I, I think interpretation and, and analysis are important and we must overcome uh, the idea amongst ourselves that what we propose are narratives which compete with other narratives. No, that we are proposing are true and sound analysis and what the others are proposing are illusions and ideologies and discourses. One thing epistemologically. And secondly, um, uh, when talking about the cultural field, uh, that uh, evokes to a certain extent the association that is about art and songs and being together. Yes, indeed, this is about all this, but it's also about um, creating a space in which rationally and scientifically can be uh, discussed about the uh, real, the, the reality of contemporary capitalism. It is not only, so to say, artistic struggle, it's an intellectual, a scientific struggle in the sense that who proposes the more realistic um, analysis and proposals are, is able to create community 
or if you wish, identity on a, a materialistic basis, uh, as Gala uh, rightfully mentioned. Thanks, Walter. I have now Kate and then Esther, please. To take Thanks, Barbara. <clears throat> um, yeah, what, what we've seen, one of the big debates, you know, in the media, in the kind of political framework is about um, why so many formerly Labour strongholds um, have become instead Tory, you know, Conservative constituencies and um, it's led to this whole discussion about, you know, working class support for the Conservative Party and so on. Um, and that it, that's a, and that's part of the whole whole debate which first emerged around the time of Brexit because the pattern is a bit mirrored there you know pro Brexit areas former working class or working class areas and former Labour areas now now Conservative um, and they've been described as the left behind places and I know this is a kind of terminology that's used elsewhere as well not just in Britain and of course. We all know that they are have become so-called left behind because of what Margaret Thatcher did in the 1980s, you know, the kind of early wave of neoliberalism, which we call monetarism and Thatcherism and, and all sorts of things. But the deindustrialization of the early neoliberal period and the deregulation and the smashing of the trade unions. I mean, one of the reasons why the left is so weak in Britain is because the strength of the trade union movement was comprehensively virtually destroyed in the 1980s and has never recovered from it. You know, and that's also had a massive impact on the Labour Party as well. This is the party of the organised um, Labour movement. Um, and so, and then if you take that together with the fact that the Labour Party under Blair, you know, in order to get the, rec the electoral recovery, embraced neoliberal economics with a kind of, a kind of more hu slightly more human face, you know, uh, but essentially embraced that. You know, those are the reasons why the working class in those more traditional Labour communities don't vote Labour. You know, so it's not necessarily a we love the Tories thing, but they no longer see that they should give their support to a Labour Party, you know, which hasn't really done anything for them. You know, so there are those, all those kinds of um, discussions going on. And of course, what Boris Johnson has done. Um, I mean, this is against the background of all the anti-immigrant stuff, blaming the immigrants for everything wrong. But he's now got what is described as he calls a levelling up agenda, which is rather than, you know, giving London a kick because everyone in the North hates London because it's cosmopolitan elite and all things like that, you know, it's to, to level up. And this means um, infrastructure projects, you know, in, and train lines and, you know, new buildings and all that kind of stuff, which is all good, of course, but who makes the profits from those things? And there's been a whole thing about the corruption of the Conservative government and, you know, from the pandemic, how their cronies make millions or billions out of, you know, the kind of orders for things to do with the pandemic and health stuff and privatisation of our National Health Service via the pandemic and so on. Uh, but also then those same cronies and corporations making profits out of the levelling up agenda. Meanwhile, as um, Walter referred to the gig economy, you know, the um, precarious thing here, which we, we call the gig economy, that continues, of course, even though the state is doing these sort of welcome things, the gig economy continues. Um, but of course, those most affected by the gig economy or participating in the gig economy are young people and migrant labour, you know, so who are predisposed to be anti-Tory and of course a lot of Corbyn's main support came from that area as well so so it, it's a very interesting thing I mean I don't know if um, Isbas Marx has done work around the age demographic question you know because here but there's a kind of common sense understanding I don't know whether it's borne out by figures or not well I think it is actually um, but it would be good to have more in-depth figures 
young people don't support the far right. They don't tend to support the conservatives. They tend to be anti-racist and all those things. And it's the older generations that are kind of trapped in this kind of nationalistic mindset, you know, and just to finally, Barbara, in, in terms of what Esther was saying, you know, about the equating, you know, fascism, communism with fascism and all that sort of thing. We've had that historical revisionism here for quite a long time, obviously, but what we do have now is uh, kind of rehabilitating the idea of the empire, you know, enough of this, you know, bleeding heart liberalism and stuff about, oh, we were bad. Now, well, actually, we did great things and we really helped them and we should have more, you know, reinstate empires and colonialism in all these states and do them a favour. You know, it's part of the, the far right Boris Johnson type narrative and it, it's absolutely nauseating, you know, and challenging that at, at a time when, as Esther rightly pointed out, you know, um, the liberal intelligentsia, left intelligentsia in our universities is under attack. You know, it, it's a challenge. Wow, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Esther, please. I would, I would like to just react to to the question, or the question, and then also to Kate and Walter. First, Kate, I don't. I mean, I'm very happy that in in UK there is this tendency. Unfortunately, in Hungary, my own research seems to suggest that actually young young workers are even more nationalistic than the older ones. <laughs> <laughs> for younger intelligentsia is different, but yeah, it might be different. But yeah, younger workers definitely are more, cons even more anti-communist, more, uh, more keen to support far right-wing positions than uh, than than their older counterparts. Uh, and method of questions, I think class is definitely a concept which should be. Uh, reworked somehow because of obviously like the old Marxist idea uh, has been has underwent uh, many many um, uh, transformations and changes because of the different nature of the dig digital economy and digitalization and post fordism or whatever we call it. Uh, so uh, yes, I think that uh, that here it is a crucial intellectual task to to find a class concept which fits. Uh, are this new uh, era of is still existing exploitation or even more existing exploitation. Uh, but I would like to add one more dimension, which is the, the importance of community. Uh, like the old left, all the circumstances, conditions reinforce the nature of community. They live together, uh, they went to work together, they were big factories with 10,000 workers, and now and, and with all, the, all of this enforce a certain sense of community collectiveness, and this is reinforced by the research that, uh, that the communist parties in Eastern Europe maintain this position artificially upkept the old industries and, and so on and so on. And when the 1989 came, that was a shock for these old working class communities uh, that, uh, that, they are, that there was a disintegration outbreak and so on and so on. And even my Eastern German interview partners who actually financially didn't lose out, uh, on the contrary, they lived better than in the old times under Honecker. So they all reflected on the loss of the communal sense that, uh, that uh, the, the life has become much more Individualized people are uh, racing for the jobs, for the houses, for the for the whatever, and this old sense of uh, community, collectivity, equality was lost. So uh, they were very strong on that. Even so, many of them didn't like Honecker's regime, but they all reflected on this lost sense of community. And I think here comes an irrational point, which is goes beyond surplus value and all that. Just consider the Nazi regime. I, I, I don't want to, to make historical parallels because it's a different era. But I think it's very important to argue not just the unemployment, but also that, uh, that, the, that the Nazis try, I mean, reinforce the se sense of commun communality with these work camps and nationality and all that and all that. So they tried to bring back the idea of, of community in a very brutal way, but, and so on and so on. But still, like, uh, it's a very nice sense, it's an issue that uh, Tony's, who was, uh, and he was an unknown Nazi and he was even kicked out by Nazis, but he has a very famous, interesting book, Gemeinschaft und Gesellschaft. And the Gemeinschaft idea was very strong, but very central to the Nazi propaganda. Uh, and I, it seems to me that at certain, certain, at a certain uh, point of history, 
this, uh, uh, this idea of Gemeinschaft community was more um, credible for many workers than the class, than the communality of class, which the left tried to propagate. And I think it's very important. Uh, for the for for the for the rise of the of the far right wing, that, and here comes what Kate said: the, the far right wing is mas mastering the the social media. That uh, how can they organize people under this new? Okay, not at the workplace, not in buses, not at the neighborhood, but where? For instance, social media. So I think it's not, uh, the, the, to 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 conclude or to add to what there's. It's not only. But, uh, but, but whether intellectually we can, I mean, one task is to intellectually work out a, a new class concept, concept, which is valid for today, but also to make it believable, to get to, to communicate it to the workers. Because then, then that is absolutely, I mean, it best, it was, they were mastering the idea of, of, of getting their message through. And they used all kinds of means, like the radio, like at that time, radio, like this mass, uh, some mass meetings, and so on and so on. Thanks, Esther. I think, uh, nonetheless, uh, as Walter has mentioned in his beginning statement, to see each other face to face is uh, another quality. It's not only for us, for our mobilization in our community and uh, the anti-fascist community. Um, it's in general, I think, a human need not to stay in the social media and in Zoom. Uh, and this brings me, I think, also uh, closer to the finishing of our uh, web seminar. Um, I uh, thank you all very much for all the interesting um, points and uh, findings you shared with us and the um, very interesting to listen uh, debate amongst you. And I really hope we can continue uh, this discussion um, uh, next year in presence uh, and go deeper and exchange on, on uh, the many um, necessary um, uh, uh, strategies uh, against uh, the far right and on the anti-fascism in Europe today. Um, I thank very much to the organizers um, of uh, the EL uh, team uh, for the excellent uh, technical preparation. And I thank very much the interpreters who did a, a great uh, job uh, in interpreting and translating uh, uh, the speeches and the questions. And um, I will uh, I ask you, of course, please um, subscribe the newsletter of the AL and of Transform. And uh, I will start now uh, the um, short film of the performance of uh, Sprung, uh, Maxim Gorky's Tag Asyl. Uh, culture is everything in our lives, but the uh, performance and theater culture is um, maybe one of the most enjoyable uh, things. So we will share this now with you. I thank you all very much and wish you a good day.
Nichts! Nichts weiß ich mehr! Kein einziges Wort! Gestern im Krankenhaus hat der Doktor zu mir! Ihr Organismus ist durch und durch mit Alkohol vergiftet! Früher als mein Organismus noch nicht mit Alkohol vergiftet war, hatte ich ein famoses Gedächtnis! Applaus! Oh, oh, ihr wisst nicht, was das ist. Applaus! Das ist wie Brandwald, verstehst du? Ja, lass dich doch kurieren. Was? <lacht> kurieren! Kurieren? Mann! So, Bruder, ja, eine Heilanstalt. Heilanstalt? Hat man für Trunkenbolde eingerichtet? So. Dann werden sie, heißt das, unentgeltlich behandelt. Unentgeltlich. Unentgeltlich. <lacht> siehst du, siehst du, man hat erkannt, dass auch Trunk Trinker. Dass auch Trinker Menschen sind. Ja. Was soll ich denn? Also geh hin, behalte dich. Wo, 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 ich hatte so einen schönen Traum. Ein Traum? Bitte? Ja. Ja? Ich träumte, Was denn? dass ich angelte. Ja. Oh. Ja. Und mit einem Mal saß mir so ein großer Blei am Haken. Oh. Nur im Traum gibt es solche Riesenkerle. Ja. Ich ziehen und ziehen und hab Angst, dass die Schnur zerreißt. Und wie ich eben mit dem Handnetz zufassen will, mit einem Mal. Was kann? Was kann? Gib mir keinen Fünfer. Oder gib mir einen Zehner. Keine Ehre, kein Gewissen. Keine Ehre, kein Gewissen. Was ist das? Keine Ehre, kein Gewissen. Nein, keine Ehre, kein Gewissen. Die ersetzen Ihnen die Stiefel nicht im Winter, wenn Sie frieren. Ich langweilig! Wie kommt das? Man lebt, lebt, alles geht gut. Und mit einmal ist es als wäre das Dorf in die Gieder gefahren. Man langweilt sich. Ja, du langweilst dich. Ah! Hey, Alter! Meinst du mich? Ja, das meint ich. Lass das hin. Ich dachte, das ist sehr schön singen. Besonders gut. Ja, den Leuten gefällt's nicht. Das stimmt. Der gut ist, der böse. Nichts lässt sich mit Bestimmtheit sagen. Kann mich nicht damit trösten, dass andere mehr stehen als ich. Und dabei in Ehren leben. Aber was hilft mir das? Gar nichts. Reue verspüre ich nicht. Habe auch kein Gewissen. Muss anders leben. Besser muss ich leben. Muss so leben, dass ich mich selber achten kann. Ja. Ab 
Leute, warnen mit mir. Es ist kein leichtes Leben, das ich führe. Alles verfault. Nichts gibt mir Halt. Nennt ihr mich anders? Nenn du mich anders. Ja, wir für dich einlegen. Wer ist das denn? Verstell dich doch nicht. Ich sage es, wie es ist. Ich wollte dir nur sagen, du hast mich Mir nichts, dir nichts, hast mir einen Hieb versetzt. Weniger Peitsch. Sag das immer. Du lebst nicht. Und mit einem Mal. Was hätte sie eine Frau muss sich meine Seele haben. Wir Männer! Wir sind Tiere. Ja. Uns muss man erst anderen zum Guten. not mature enough to tell it how it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house was on fire, because it is. Ich halte auf vor, 
i första handen. Varum har ni inte tillsammangekärt? Vi oft har vi inte som gesagt. Das ihr die Bude reinhalten sollt. Der Schauspieler ist dran. Der Schauspieler ist dran. Mir ist ganz klar, wer dran ist. Aber ich dran. Und du? Warum siehst du mich so blöd rein? Wovon ist deine Fratze schon geschwollen? Geh auf! Dass mir kein Stäubchen hier liegen bleibt! Überall liegt Schmutz! Denn die Mecker liegt Schmutz! Die Wahrheit. Ja. 
Der Mensch trägt selbst die Kosten. Davor ist er frei. Der Mensch ist die Wahrheit. Tari, 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 tari,